Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, This morning our our text is taken from Luke chapter 2, what I read for you a few moments ago in our gospel reading, but I also want to read the second account of that from Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took his wife. But he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. This morning on this Christmas celebration, we're going to take a look at these events of what we call the Nativity, and we're going to look at them from another perspective. Throughout the course of the past several weeks on our journey through this series, um, I have kind of taken on the character of Joseph or Zechariah or one of the shepherds or one of the Magi. I don't dare take on this next perspective, because I don't think I could get it. But I want to try to look down on this moment, on these events that I just read to you, and try to see them from heaven's perspective. What was God up to? Have you ever wondered that in your own life? Like, what what, what is God up to? I know in my own life, I, I have a this tendency to try to figure out what God's doing. I, I kind of like the movie, uh, the, the, the Lego movie, where you've kind of got the master builders who are doing all the building and stuff behind the scenes, and they're assembling all the stuff, and it seems as if they're manipulating everything in the background, and you're forced to live within a set of boundaries. And I wonder, is that what God's up to? Is he just manipulating everything behind the scenes, forcing us to live by, by some really rigid, structured set of things? sure doesn't seem right. A lot of people think of God as a puppeteer, and they're like, oh, look, we're just a bunch of marionettes, a bunch of morons floating around on strings, and God's making us do all these things. I don't think that's quite what God was up to either. I think God was up to four things on that Christmas morning, and I want to talk about all four of those things. I think the first thing God was up to in doing the whole nativity thing, the way it went down, the really important stuff, right? So like Jesus, born of a virgin, really important deal. Born of a virgin, not something you see every day. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever seen that hit the news. Um, And we talk about just about anything we can on the news these days. And not once have I seen the headline in, in my 45 years of life, Virgin-born child arrives at OSU or Riverside or any place else for that matter. So what was God up to in Matthew chapter 1 and in Luke chapter 2? I think God was up to the business of demonstrating miraculous power. I mean, just think about it. God can give us his son. I don't know if that really has sunk into many people. I I think about this a lot. God, like God, the whole booming voice, the whole behold kind of thing, like the really deep and booming, massive power of all creation, can be all places, all the time, has all the power you can even dream of, and then some. He can do anything and everything, and he doesn't even have to snap his fingers or wave a wand. It's just let there be, and it happens. That God crammed into a 
in the words of the genie from Aladdin, an itty-bitty living space. All the power of God nestled in this little tiny baby on Christmas morning. Have you ever thought of that? Like, that's pretty significant. I mean, from heaven's perspective, you, you've, you've got to almost kind of picture looking down upon the earth from an airplane if you get the privilege of having a window seat and you look out the window and you peer down at, at the earth as you're taking off and everything starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And, smaller. and you look. The God who created all that all the intricacies that you see up close and all the abstract that you see from far away, the God who did all of that in a tiny little baby, cradled in his arms, crying when he was born. I mean, that's some pretty, pretty miraculous power. That's some pretty cool stuff. God was demonstrating significant miraculous power in putting all of his power, all of who he was into this little newborn child. I think that's pretty spectacular. And I think we might overlook that a little too often at Christmas time. But I don't think he was just showing off. I don't think it was a, a flash of power. Hey, check me out. I think there was something else. It was a demonstration of miraculous power, but I also think that he was showing us that he was going to do for us what we could never do ourselves. I have a confession to make. I, I, I like to fix things. As a type A personality and as a dude, I, I think I have this problem that I see a problem and I try to fix the problem. I mean, let, let me give you a for instance. There, there was one time um, somebody said that their, their low tire pressure light was on in their car. And my gut reaction is, well, put air in it. Or let me go grab my air compressor and I'll put air in it. Or, or there's times when, when my wife will come home and she'll, she'll tell me about a problem that she's having and I'm going, well, here is the three-point solution. Just do these three things, enact this plan, and wham, it's done. When really, she doesn't care what my plan is. She just wants to share the problem. Oh. Whoops. I think a lot of times in life as Christians, we're trying to fix a problem that we can't fix. I think as Christians, we're trying to do something that isn't within our realm of power to do. And so I think God, in that virgin birth on that first Christmas, was doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. I mean, have you ever thought about it for a minute? Why things happened the way they happened? I mean, let's just look at it. You are to call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. We talk about the names of Jesus, Emmanuel, which means God with us. We, we talk about that wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, cool stuff. But how often do we talk about the name Jesus? We throw it around all the time, right? Jesus lived for us. He died and rose for us. He's coming back for us. But do you know what the word Jesus means? It means God saves. His very name tells us why he's here. We can't save ourselves. I mean, if you don't know how to swim and I throw you in the ocean, which I would never do, by the way, but if you can't swim and I throw you in the middle of a raging ocean and I say, save yourself, it's kind of a better scenario than where we are with our own sins. And so Jesus enters the picture. God saves. But why did, why did Jesus have to be born the way he was born? If Jesus was only man, he could never forgive us of our sins. He could never save us. He could just be blamed for all of our sin. But if Jesus was only God and not man at all, he couldn't carry our sin because the perfect and holy God can't exist in the presence of sin. And so to have Jesus as both 100% fully God and 100% fully man, you have, you have this ability 
for Jesus to carry your sin and mine and that of everybody else, but not just carry it, also cleanse it and forgive you and me and save you and me and set us up for an amazing eternity with him forever in heaven. God was demonstrating some pretty significant power taking all of who God is and packing it into this little baby who was both 100% God and 100% man, showing us that the cradle means nothing without the cross, and the cross means nothing without the cradle. But there was another thing he was up to. He was demonstrating his faithfulness. There's a quotation in our text. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. It says that right there in in Matthew chapter 1 verse 23, but it's quoted from Isaiah 7 verse 14, which was prophesied 700 years earlier. Now think about that for just a hot second. 700 years earlier, Isaiah says, Behold, there's going to be this virgin who's going to conceive and give birth to a son, and they're going to call him Emmanuel because he's going to be God with us. And then 700 years later, God's like, Oh yeah, remember that thing I told you about 700 years ago? Didn't forget. Just working on my timeline, not yours. Boom. All of creation in an itty-bitty living space. Wham, my son. I think it's pretty significant when we realize that God is faithful. We had a thing growing up in my house where um, when you say, I promise, you can't change your mind. And so we would, we would say things that were sometimes kind of off the wall. Sometimes we'd be like, yeah, mom, I cleaned my room. Promise. Okay, I'll go clean my room. Right? If we promised, we, we, we better have done the thing. In the birth of Jesus, God shows us that his promise is kept. 700-year-old promise. Could you imagine being the people of Israel? Hearing this promise and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting generation after generation, all the ups and the downs, and believe me, there were some roller coaster rides for the Israelite people. And here they are, 400 years of silence after the last prophet, and boom, Jesus is born. 700 years after the promise, boom, Jesus is born. God demonstrating miraculous power by putting all of his divinity into this tiny baby, showing that Jesus was both 100% God and 100% man, and showing us that he is faithful. Faithful to his word. Faithful to his promise. But I think there's one more thing that God is up to on Christmas. In this thing that we call the incarnation, the birth of Jesus, where God becomes man, puts on skin like you and me, I think he's showing us one more thing. That Jesus is unique. Jesus is indescribably unique. There's a Bible verse that is tattooed on many people's bodies, and it's held up on banners, and it's put up on signs at sporting events. It's from the Gospel of John, the third chapter, the 16th verse. For God so loved the world that he gave, eh, some guy. No, no, no. His one and only son. Do you realize how unique that is? He gave his one and only son. There is only one, literally only one, who was both God and man. There is only one who was virgin born. There is only one who was conceived by a virgin named Mary, who was born in a manger, who would live a sinless life and die a sinner's death. There is only one who would willingly stretch his arms out on a cross. There is only one who would be buried in a tomb and rise again. There is only one who could make this Christmas about something far greater than bounce houses and stockings. There is only one. There is only one who could give our candy canes new meaning. 
There is only one who could shine brighter than our Christmas trees. There is only one who could take all that is heaven and combine it with all that is humanity and show us exactly what God has in store for us. This Christmas, the real meaning of Christmas, it's not going to be found under a tree, but it's found in a tree. Not the tree that's got the lights and the ornaments, but in the tree. Don't you find it odd that on Christmas we celebrate with a tree, and on Easter we celebrate the emptiness of the tree? Don't you find it odd that when Jesus was born, he was laid bare for the world to see, and when he died, he was laid bare for the world to see? Don't you find it odd that they came to adore him when he was born, and they came to hate him when he died? Don't you find it odd? that all of life collides in two moments. We call them Christmas and Easter. But to be honest, you can't have one without the other. Easter has no meaning if God wasn't born as a man. And Christmas has no meaning if that God-man didn't die and rise. So today, as we celebrate Christmas, as we celebrate the birth of our Savior King, we remember that God was demonstrating his miraculous power by taking everything of himself and infusing it into that morning till, to that day. He was doing what we could never do, what we could never imagine, in a way that we couldn't even dream. He was answering a prayer we never prayed, he was addressing a problem we didn't even know existed. He was doing the impossible, the indescribable, showing us how unique and magnificent his own son would be. Now this really cool thing happens, and Spencer reminded us of this in our children's message. The greatest gift we receive is the gift of a child who would become a king who would give us his spirit. So for those of us who call on the name of the Lord, we've received that spirit into ourselves. We've been baptized into the very name of God. We've been adopted as children of God. And so now, while Jesus is the only 100% God and 100% man, because of his life, death, and resurrection, because of his incarnation, because of his empty cross and his unoccupied tomb, you and I are considered 100% sinner, which I think you already knew. But you're already 100% saint because of what God has done in, through, and for you. The greatest gift I could ever give you this Christmas is to remind you that Christ came for you. Everything that I just said about all the magnificent and miraculous stuff of heaven coming into a baby, that was for you. The greatest present was wrapped in swaddling cloths, and it was wrapped in a cloth on a cross. The greatest present you could ever receive didn't have red ornaments, but rather blood dripping from his hands. The greatest present you could ever receive at Christmas cried as a baby and cried in agony. The greatest present you could ever receive came to redeem you. So open your stockings. Unwrap your presents. Celebrate with your family. Sing your songs. But worship. Worship the king who became nothing to make you everything. Because that is what it looks like to have grace among us. I'd like to pray for you this morning. Jesus, we want to wish you a happy birthday. It sounds kind of corny, but we do. Because without your birth, this day wouldn't mean anything. Jesus, we, we pray that as we go through our day today, as we celebrate this day with family and friends, as we unwrap our presents, we do our special meals, we do any of the fun things that we normally do on this Christmas day, we pray that you would remind us why this day exists that this day is a day to celebrate all of heaven crashing into earth and changing everything about who we are. So Jesus, thank you. Thank you for putting on a body like ours to do that which we would never do on our own. 
which we never could do on our own. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being the greatest gift this Christmas. Amen.